Welcome to the Belly Button Window Channel and Episode 11 of the Jimi Hendrix Story, like you've never heard it before. In this episode we examine each day in June of 1967, including the landmark Savile Theatre Sgt. Pepper's gig, the experience's first tour of the USA, Hendrix at the Monterey Pop Festival and Jimmy Jamming with LA's Rock Elite. Please check the community tab and video information where you will find links to the video performances and stunning photographs from the period. Thursday, June 1, 1967. The experience rehearses at the Savile Theatre, Shaftesbury Avenue, London, from 2.30pm to 5.30pm. On the same day, Roger Law, a freelance caricaturist and illustrator for the Sunday Times, sketches the members of the experience at Chaz's flat, which Jimmy shared, at 43 Upper Barclay Street in London, for the cover of their forthcoming album, Axis Bold as Love. Unlike the previous album, Are You Experienced?, the covers of both the UK and American versions of the LP were the same, except that the latter would have the lyrics printed inside. Roger Law, later of spitting image fame, did the head drawings of Jimmy, Noel and Mitch, which were then superimposed on top of the multicolored Indian religious motif poster, which Track Records art director David King says he bought in the Indica bookshop in London. So much for the claim at the time that the cover artwork cost £3,000. Hmm... Also on that day, Jimmy was interviewed by Dawn James for Rave magazine, published later in August of 1967. The article by Dawn James was titled, Jimi Hendrix Wild Man, followed by the subtitle, Jimi Hendrix is wild, but not as wild as he makes out to be. Friday the 2nd of June, further rehearsals at the Savile Theatre, finishing around 2.30pm. Later that evening, Jimmy and Chaz Chandler attended a Pink Floyd concert at UFO, the Blarney Club, Tottenham Court Road, London. Saturday, 3rd of June. Photo call, London. With photographer Fiona Adams for Fabulous 208 magazine. Fiona Adams had also done a photo shoot with Jimmy a few months earlier, of which she recalled, I took these photographs while Jimmy was on tour in England in April 1967. The garden of an overnight hotel in Lincoln provided the background for this morning shoot. June Southworth of the magazine Fab, 208, and I had travelled on the tour coach with Jimmy. Having the opportunity to sit close and to chat with him for hours on the coach, we felt that we were beginning to know him a little more intimately and to detect aspects of his character not usually displayed on stage. We glimpsed an intelligent and surprisingly gentle, almost meditative side to his nature. This is what I have attempted to capture here. Sunday the 4th of June Neville Chesters, who had previously worked with The Who, The Bee Gees and The Mersey Beats, officially appointed the experience's road manager. However, the day will be remembered for the Savile Theatre Concerts, London. Two shows, 6pm and 8.30pm, with both sold out. The support acts were the Stormsville Shakers, Procol Harum, The Chiffons and the Denny Lane String Band. Noel commented, The farewell show at the Savile Theatre is bound to be a biggie. We even rehearsed for it and did a special photo session. The set list for both shows was as follows. Sgt. Pepper's Lonely Hearts Club Band, Foxy Lady, Like a Rolling Stone, Manic Depression, Hey Joe, Purple Haze, The Wind Cries Mary, and Are You Experienced? It is important to realize that this concert takes place three days after the release of the famous Beatles album, Sgt. Pepper's Lonely Hearts Club Band, which would be the artistic and popular pinnacle of the psychedelic era. While the eponymous song that opens the album is in everyone's head, the Jimi Hendrix experience starts the show with its own version of the title. The audience at the Savile, which included Paul McCartney and George Harrison, couldn't believe it. Paul later publicly acknowledged that Jimmy's version was excellent. At the time, there was much mutual respect between the two bands. The Beatles and the experience were not only friends, but it was George Harrison who introduced Jimmy to Oriental Sounds, and Paul McCartney, who personally recommended Jimmy to the organizers of the Monterey Pop Festival. At the end of a supercharged second show, Jimmy smashes his 1965 Stratocaster during the finale performance of Are You Experienced, a guitar he had especially painted red and decorated with arabesques on the front and a sacrificial poem on the back. This is what Jimmy had written on the back of it before the ritual sacrifice. May this be love or just confusion, born out of frustration, Racked feelings of not being able to make true physical love to the universal gypsy, queen of true, free-expressed music, my darling guitar, 
please rest in peace, amen. A ritual act that the musician performed religiously, as at the Savile Theatre in London on June 4, 1967, just before flying to California and creating a similar event at the Monterey Festival. In Britain and Europe, Jimmy had proved himself. There was no doubt that he had the potential for international stardom, but first he had to crack America, and for Jimmy that task held a special significance. Unlike all the other artists who had spearheaded the British invasion since 1964, Jimmy was going home. Finally, it is reported that after the Savile gig, Jimmy and Mitch attended the Turtles concert at the Speakeasy Club London, along with Peter Asher, Brian Jones, Danny Lane and Terry Stamp. Before leaving to America, between the 5th and 12th of June, following the Savile concerts and before leaving to America, the group completed a number of interviews and photo sessions, most notably working with photographer Carl Ferris on shots that would later grace the US cover of their debut album, Are You Experienced? Although Warner Brothers hadn't yet set a date for the album's release, they were willing to try another single, with Purple Haze being the obvious choice. Warners were no doubt hoping the song might capture at least some of the success it had enjoyed in Britain, as opposed to the debut release, Hey Joe, which was a total failure. Up until then, the reprise label had enjoyed sporadic success, primarily as an outlet for friends and associates of Frank Sinatra, such as Dean Martin and Sammy Davis Jr. However, now under the leadership of Morris Moe Austin, it looked set to become a major player of the future by developing a roster of talented new acts, including the experience. Monday 5th of June Jimmy's interviewed by Norrie Drummond for New Musical Express for the edition which was published on the 10th of June. Drummond observed, The flat Jimmy shares with his manager is tastefully furnished with long couches, leather armchairs, a teak coffee table, original paintings, and the latest hi-fi equipment. Later that day at Olympic Sound Studios, London, studio recording of Cat Talking to Me. The 6th through to the 10th of June, the Carl Ferris photo sessions. Over a four-day period, the Jimi Hendrix Experience did several photo sessions with photographer Carl Ferris, some in the studio, as well as at the Royal Botanic Garden in Kew. Some of the photos were used on a track records promotional card, the others on the back page of a Schroeder Music Sheet music songbook. Carl Ferris also took the photos for other Jimi Hendrix Experience record covers, including the American release of Are You Experienced? on Reprise and the back cover of the American release of Electric Ladyland. The Carl Ferris Interview The first time I saw Jimi Hendrix was at his debut showcase of The Experience at the Bag O'Nails Club in London in January 1967. This was where I saw members of the Beatles, the Rolling Stones, the Animals, Graham Nash, Eric Clapton and many other in the rock elite watching, awestruck as Jimmy unleashed his powerful music on them. They were thunderstruck and completely blown away, as evidenced by the awesome silence after he finished, followed by a thunderous applause with all those jaded rock stars going crazy over his performance. Pete Townsend turned to Clapton and said, We might as well go and work for the post office now. Jimmy was the talk of the London after that. Later, in May 1967, apparently Jimmy saw my Holly's Evolution cover which had recently been released and said to his manager Chaz Chandler that he wanted something similar, something psychedelic. On his Are You Experienced album, when it was to be released in the USA, he was not happy with its UK cover which, he said, made him look like a fairy. So he sent Chaz off to contact me. We set up an appointment to meet at Jimmy's flat in London, and I took my portfolio along. He loved my work, especially the psychedelic shots, and asked me if I would create a new album cover design for the Reprise Records release in the US. I said yes, and that I would have to absorb his music for inspiration. He said that I should accompany him to Olympic Studios, where he was recording his next LP titled Axis Bold as Love. I was totally mind-blown by what I heard there. The sheer power of his psychedelic experimentation was awe-inspiring, but when taking a break from playing, he was a very nice, unaffected and a shy kind of a guy. He asked me where I was from and I mentioned that I had lived in Vancouver for four years. He was surprised and said that he also had lived in Vancouver with his grandmother for a while. We then started smoking joints and swapping Vancouver stories, and we got on famously. At 4am the next morning, 
I went home with some tapes of the session and the music from the UK Are You Experienced record to use for inspiration for the US album design. I played the music all day and raved about the music to my girlfriend Anka, saying that it sounded so far out that it seemed to come from outer space. This gave me the idea of the group traveling through space in a biosphere on their way to bring their unworldly space music to Earth, and so I then set about sketching some designs of this. For the cover I decided to use my new infrared technique which I had invented, which combines the photographic color reversal image with the heat signature and, seemingly, the ability to see the life force of plant and human life. It even appears to capture auras. To create the spherical photo I decided to use a giant fisheye lens invented by Nikon, which was much bigger than my Nikon F camera. I would shoot in Kew Botanical Gardens in London where they had the kind of foliage that would react well to my infrared technique. Jimmy loved this idea when I explained to him how this technique worked, and as I leave nothing to chance and design all the elements of my album cover shots, I had fashion and styling experience from my work in fashion photography, I wanted to pick out the clothes that the group members were going to wear in the shot. I first went to Jimmy's flat to see what he had, and when I looked in his cupboard I saw a painted jacket that an artist had given to him saying, I painted this for you. It had large double pupil eyes painted on the chest, smaller eyes circling the back and psychedelic swirls everywhere else. I said, this is it. The eyes represent the mirror to the soul and the psychedelic vision. Jimmy agreed and said he felt his was part of him and called it the gypsy eyes jacket. Later that evening, when Jimmy was coming out of the shower before the gig later that night, I was amazed to see his hair all napped out, as he would normally wear it like the English guys, straightened out and lacquered down into a long beetle cut. I said to him, why don't you wear it like that? It looks far out. But he said, it looks like shit. I countered, no man, it looks unique and spacey. It's just what we need for the cover. His hair just needed to be evened up. And so at my suggestion, his girlfriend trimmed it into a ball and we had what was later called an afro. After the Sudanese Africans who had always worn their hair like that. The next day, when Jimmy's bandmates Noel Redding and Mitch Mitchell saw his hair, they really liked it, so I suggested that they have it too. My hairstylist Johanna permed their hair into afros so they would have a uniform look, and we then went shopping in Kings Road boutiques for outfits for the guys. When everything was ready, we hired a Rolls-Royce limo and drove down to Kew Gardens, where I found the perfect tree which had foliage that reached the ground. I had the guys stand back inside the leaves and shot them through the fisheye lens from a low angle, to emphasize Jimmy's hands. We didn't shoot long as we had arrived late and we ran out of light, but we returned the following day and shot some more. After the session, to celebrate, we walked across the road to an ancient Elizabethan pub and downed many ales and smoked joints in the garden. It was a good thing that we had a chauffeur to drive us back to London. When I got the shots back from Kodak, I was amazed and pleased with spherical fisheye picture and the colors that had been created in it. As it turned out, the shot used on the RU experienced. US cover was the first frame on the first roll. It was just meant to be. And another fisheye image from that session would later become the International Smash Hits photo cover. The Kodak lab manager had great praise for the pictures when I picked them up. So when I next took them over to Jimmy's house, he was very pleased and excited and said that the shot was really psychedelic and truly represented his music. You are the only photographer that is doing with photography what I am doing with music. Knocking down the barriers and going far out beyond the limits. He said that he wanted this image for the covers of his US and international releases of his debut album and that I should design the whole album cover for submission to Warner slash Reprise Records. I said that I would be delighted. He then called up Mitch, Noel and Chaz to come over and see the new album cover shots. Everyone was very pleased as they were seen as the perfect images to represent the experience worldwide. We planned a big celebration party that night. We took some LSD and went to the Bag O' Nails Club, where Jimmy jammed with Jeff Beck, and then took some groupies back to Jimmy's flat and partied all night. The next day, I began work on designing the album cover. I started with the spheres flying through space concept, but as this would be a very wide format, this would only work on a double gatefold cover. I found out from Chaz Chandler that Reprise was being cheap and would only produce a single cover, so I had to rethink the design. I began with the approved fisheye shot, over which I placed a gold leaf mate with a hole cut to fit the circular photograph, 
and added purple filigree psychedelic lettering printed on the gold metallic matter, which would make the lettering also seem metallic. I had an artist friend of mine do the lettering, for which I paid 20 UK pounds to own. I then organized a photo session in my studio for the back cover shot. I wanted to make a group portrait, emphasizing the group's Afro hairstyles, and so I shot it in black and white with their hair backlit to make halos around their heads. The guys loved that shot also. I then made a printer ready slick of the finished design and sent it to Reprise Records for printing the final cover. Unfortunately, they decided to pursue a cheaper route and not use the gold matte design layer, but to print it all together. Photo, lettering and border all in one layer, using gold ink instead for the gold matte surround. Disappointingly, by choosing this cheaper arrangement, the label's art director was given the AD credit, although it was still my same design and art direction. When Jimmy saw the release, he was very upset, as it lost a lot of its visual impact he wanted by using the gold ink border instead of the metallic gold matte surround layer, and also because they had claimed the art direction credit. He was very apologetic to me and disappointed, but as it was already out, there was nothing he could do about it. But he said that he wanted to use one of the studio portrait shots for the Axis Bold As Love album that he was currently working on. He said that although the design for that record was by someone else, featuring a Hindu poster design from India, they wanted to use my headshot of the group as an illustration to replace the Hindu godheads that were featured in the center. And so, as it turned out, with the photos I supplied to reprise for the cover of 1968's Electric Ladyland album, the final Experience album that was released, my images were on all three of the US Experience albums issued in Jimmy's lifetime. I was fortunate, and am very proud of my association and friendship with Jimmy. He was a prince of a man and we spent many creative hours together discussing philosophy, art and music. I was also fortunate to have been able to watch many of his mesmerizing performances in the studio and on stage. He was the ultimate performer. You just couldn't take your eyes off him. He once told me that the music played him, but he played the guitar with total mastery, with every inspiration that came into his mind instantly transmitted through his fingers to caress, slide, strum, beat and squeeze the music out of his guitar. Like a wizard, he would move around his instrument concocting musical magic that would entrance everyone who heard it. He had perfect pitch and timing. He would first play the melody and then go further out in his improvisation than anyone else could, and all the while you could still hear the melody. He could immerse himself deeply in a psychedelic, electronic improvisation, and then suddenly, on the beat, he'd bring it back to the melody of the tune. He was the perfect combination of soul and technique, a total genius, an Amadeus Mozart for the 20th century. Roto Sound before the experience flew to the USA for their summer 67 tour, Jimmy and Noel did a photo session for Rotosound guitar strings at the Fairfield Halls in Croydon, 1967. Alan Markerson from Rotosound recalled, When musicians were looking for a specific sound or concept, they would come visit me at the factory. Jimi Hendrix was not pleased with the sounds he would get when he bit his strings, so I developed a gauge which he thought tasted right. We helped him get the sound he was looking for. The 8th of June. Are you experienced peaks at number two on the UK album charts, only prevented from reaching number one due to the Beatles, Sgt. Pepper's Lonely Hearts Club Band, LP, occupying the top spot? The 9th of June was spent at Olympic Sound Studios London, recordings of the track, If Six Was Nine. The 10th of June saw an interview for Disc and Music Echo in Upper Berkeley Street Flat, for the edition published June 17, 1967. Monday the 12th of June. The group receives a Western Union cable, addressed to Eric Burden and the Animals and the Jimi Hendrix Experience, dated June 12th, 1967, from Alan Pariser, Monterey International Pop Festival, telling them, You will be met on arrival in Monterey by Pop Festival staff. Best wishes for a good weekend. Tuesday, 13th of June. Jimmy, Chaz Chandler, Mike Jeffrey and Keith Ultam fly from London Heathrow Airport to New York City, USA, with Mitch and Noel taking a flight one day later. Keith Ultham, of New Musical Express, recalled, We drove to London Airport in Mike Jeffrey's Rolls Royce. We picked up Jimi Hendrix and Chaz from their flat and continued to the airport where Jimmy ransacked the bookstall for a science fiction novel. 
We were all on that plane, Chaz, Jimmy, Mike and I. First class, thank you very much. First trip to America. Wonderful, terrific time it was. Arriving at Kennedy Airport, we were met by a long, sleek black Cadillac. Without pausing to check into the hotel, Jimmy shot down to the Colony Record Center, just off Broadway, and bought half a dozen LPs by people like The Doors and The Mothers of Invention. The first thing we did, we booked into this dreadful, notorious hotel called The Chelsea, then moved to the Buckingham Hotel instead. Of course, there was supposed to be one murder every week. I found this out subsequently, and I just thought it was a wonderful American hotel. Later that evening, Jimmy attends a Richie Havens concert at the Café A Go Go in Greenwich Village. Wednesday the 14th of June. Mitch and Noel, along with Brian Jones and Eric Burden, fly from London to New York City. Noel recalled, Things weren't coming in half measures. I was flying first class to New York, seated next to Brian Jones, who had taken me under his wing. While Mitch added, We'd been looking forward to going to the States for the first time in my life, and Noel's. There we were, first-class seats on TWA. Eric Burden was on the flight, and so was Brian Jones. Mike Jeffrey was cognizant to the realities of the music industry of the 60s, a landscape where record royalties could never generate the kind of income to justify the effort required in establishing an artist. Touring was the key to financial success, as well as a means to creating a mystique and establishing an image, two factors prominent in Jeffrey's business plan. After arriving in New York, Jeffrey took Hendrix to the office of Premier Talent, a burgeoning booking agency, and Teen Mail Limited, a fan club organization where Jimmy was introduced to Frank Barcelona, Bob Levine, and Kathy Ebeth. Toting a copy of Hey Joe, Jeffrey asked Barcelona to find some American bookings for the group, and at the same time asked Levine to work for Hendrix. Jeffrey had met Bob Levine in 1964, when he first brought the animals over to the U.S. at the time Levine was a stage manager at the Paramount Theatre in Times Square and he helped snare a booking for the band at the Apollo, making the Animals the first British group to play the legendary Harlem venue. Barcelona ran an aggressive and independent booking agency, having scored a coup by booking US dates for fellow track artists, The Who, and other British groups such as The Hollies and Herman's Hermits. Levine, meanwhile, ran Teen Mail Limited, which handled fan club licensing and merchandising for all artists in the premier stable. In addition, Levine had acted as tour manager for the Beatles' North American excursions. Keith Ultham of New Musical Express recalled, With Jimmy dressed in multicolored floral jacket, white trousers, emerald green scarf and gold medallion embossed with the words Champion Birdwatcher, we discovered he had obtained the honorary title of the man most unlikely to get a taxi in New York. Going on to point out that, Getting cabs was a lot of fun at that time with Jimmy, because you had three chances of not getting a cab in the village. One, if you were sort of a weird-looking hippie. Two, if you had long hair. And three, if you were black. And he made it on all three accounts. So not only would the cabs not stop for him, they would try and run him over. So we would have to hide him in doorways and go and stop a cab. Then we would get in the cab, and even then the cabbies would tell him to get out. We had to get out of a couple of cabs and I'd get a bit humpty about it. But of course, a year or two later, when Jimmy went back as a superstar, they couldn't do enough for him. Later that night, Jimmy and Chaz attend the Doors concert at the Scene Club, 301 West 46th Street, New York. Thursday the 15th of June. Flying from John F. Kennedy International Airport, New York City, to San Francisco International Airport, California. Barry Jenkins of The New Animals had the following recollection. We, the new animals, were on the same flight, and I'll never forget seeing Hendrix sitting in his seat with his ear pushed up against the sidewall of the plane. I asked him what he was doing, and he said, I'm getting inspiration for the next album, man. He was listening to the sounds of the engine vibrating inside the walls. Later on the 15th, Jimmy attends the Straight Theatre San Francisco, where the Grateful Dead and the Wildflowers are performing, followed by a private party to celebrate the opening of the theatre. Friday the 16th of June Sees Jimmy arriving at Monterey Airport, Keith Ultham recalled. We stayed overnight in San Francisco and early next morning set out to find an indestructible guitar for Jimmy. I need a Fender, explained Jimmy. We failed to get the model Jimmy wanted, but somehow he later acquired one in Monterey. It was the wrong color, but he remedied that by spraying it white and drawing swirling designs all over it with a felt pen. 
Saturday the 17th of June. The day is spent with rehearsals and preparation for the group's performance the following day, while Jimmy also attends Ravi Shankar's Monterey performance. The Monterey Experience The experience arrived on Friday, June 16th, the first day of the festival. Organizers had decorated the venue with a hundred thousand orchids, and it seemed like everyone in Monterey had flowers in their hair. The promoters had counted on 10,000 fans, but there were 90,000 spectators, and also there were alternative stages which were installed outside the festival for jam sessions. The experience was not due to play until Sunday evening. On Saturday, Jimmy mingled with the crowd along with Electric Flag's Buddy Miles, Eric Burden and Brian Jones. He wore his old military jacket with an I'm a Virgin badge. Jones sported his old wizard's cloak. It would have been impossible to look stranger than them, points out Eric Burden. Brian was dressed like a rich old woman full of furs, and Jimmy was just extravagant. That Saturday, Jimmy watched the performance of the Electric Flag, then the Big Brother and the Holding Company. It was an opportunity for him to see Janis Joplin in one of her most significant concerts of the festival. But the event of the day was Otis Redding, who amazed the crowd with his talent and mastery of the stage. Steve Cropper on guitar accompanied Otis on stage, and Jimmy chatted briefly with the guitarist backstage. It had only been three years since Jimmy, then unknown, had visited him at Stax. Still backstage, Jimmy was delighted to speak with Jerry Miller of Mooby Grape, whom he had first met at the Spanish Castle in Seattle. They joked about the chest size of Gail Harris, a teenager who sang with the fabulous Wailers. In the night, during one of the many improvised jams, Jimmy asked to borrow Miller's Gibson L5 just to try it out. Jimmy went up to an alternate stage while the people around him slept. In fact, people started to grumble when they saw it, because nobody knew who it was and they wanted to sleep, recalls Eric Burden. He started playing his beautiful, sad, melodious stuff, and then it turned into a party jam. The sleepy crowd got to see Jimmy on stage with Ron Pippen McKernan of The Grateful Dead, Jorma Kokonen and Jack Cassidy from the Jefferson Airplane, and probably Jerry Garcia from The Grateful Dead playing Walking the D.O.D. and Good Morning Little Schoolgirl. None of them was a legend remembers Jack Cassidy. The unique thing about Monterey was that all of these musicians got to meet. On Sunday, Jimmy hosted another backstage jam during the Grateful Dead concert with Janis Joplin, Mama Cass, Roger Daltrey, Eric Burden and Brian Jones singing together, Sgt. Peppers. We were making a lot of noise, remembers Eric Burden and Bill Graham came down from the stage to tell us to shut your effing mouths. Although no one could foresee Monterey's historical significance at the time, Jimmy was well aware that this show was the American debut of the experience, and a lot was at stake. For Hendrix, it was a bit of a strange homecoming, notes Noel Redding. He left as an R&B cover musician and came back with a rock band formed with two white guys. Previously, Jimmy had yet to achieve success in the United States, and fame was still uncertain. Success in England guaranteed nothing in America. To stand out, Jimmy spent the afternoon painting psychedelic swirls on his Stratocaster. The organization of Monterey was vague, and the order of passage of the groups for Sunday was not precisely defined. The mamas and papas were supposed to close the show, and Ravi Shankar was to open it, but nothing was decided on when Jimmy and The Who would come. The Grateful Dead, also scheduled that afternoon, agreed to play any time. Jimmy and The Who, we were both desperate to get noticed, remembers Pete Townsend. We had very short times and we were in competition. Jimmy really didn't want to play after The Who. Eventually, organizer John Phillips decided to resolve the matter between The Who and the JHE by drawing lots. The winner would go first, the loser would follow. The Who won and Jimmy was a bad loser. If I have to come after you, he told Townsend in a menacing voice, I'll turn heaven and earth upside down. Jimmy left to inquire about lighter fluid, as The Who took the stage to perform a huge concert that would launch their career in America. When Townsend smashed his guitar at the end of the set, he did so with such force that shrapnel hit D.A. Pennebaker, the maker of the concert film, who was ten yards away. Sunday, 18th of June, 1967, The Monterey Performance Brian Jones introduces the Jimi Hendrix experience to the Monterey audience. The set list was as follows. Killing Floor, Foxy Lady, Like a Rolling Stone, Rock Me Baby, Hey Joe, Can You See Me, The Wind Cries Mary, Purple Haze and Wild Thing, 
The Monterey performances on the Sunday in order were as follows. Ravi Shankar, The Blues Project, Buffalo Springfield, The Who, Grateful Dead, The Jimi Hendrix Experience, and The Mamas and The Papas. The experience's performance concluded with a version of the classic song Wild Thing, originally written by Chip Taylor and later made famous by the Trogs. As Noel Redding remembered, we were in fine form, the rapport was perfect, and we flew through a great set. Jimmy finished by burning his guitar. The lighter fluid was being stubborn again. But once it did finally flare up, the audience exploded. Jimmy whipped the flames through the air, demolishing the guitar. Later, when Jimmy started smashing guitars more often, it was because the sound effects were better than burning, and he'd used the same re-glued breakaway guitar. It took ages for the crowd to settle for the next act. We'd gone a bomb! For an in-depth look at the Monterey Festival and Hendrix's performance, take a look at the Belly Button Window Monterey Pop Festival episode. Monday the 19th of June. Jimmy flew from Monterey to San Francisco, then on to Los Angeles, where he moved in with John Papa Phillips in the Los Angeles suburb of Bel Air. Sometime that day, Hendrix visited the Reprise Records office in Los Angeles, recording session for the album The Cake by the all-girl trio The Cake. According to an article in Go magazine, number 69, published on the 21st of July, 1967, in an interview, Jimi Hendrix said he just had to play guitar for some of the tracks. The other notable event was the release of the Purple Haze and the Wind Cries Mary single in the US. Tuesday, 20th of June. Mike Jeffrey signs a contract with US rock entrepreneur Dick Clark for the experience to support the Monkees on their upcoming US tour. Chaz Chandler recalled in an interview, Michael Jeffrey phones up. I've just done it, a great deal, a nationwide tour. So I said, oh yeah, who with? And he said, the monkeys. Are you out of your mind? And Jimmy is sitting there while I got the phone call. I just tore into him over the telephone. I flew back to New York and I just ramped it at him. This is absurd, it's going to be crap. Tuesday the 20th through to Sunday, 25th of June, the Fillmore West, San Francisco, California. For six consecutive nights, from Tuesday through to Sunday, the band performed two shows a night, 40 minutes each, $500 a night at the Fillmore Auditorium, followed by jamming and partying the rest of the time. The experience were being given the royal treatment in San Francisco. As Mitch recalled, we'd heard of the Fillmore, but nothing more. But thank God for Bill Graham, booking us for six straight nights. We were staying down on Fisherman's Wharf in a hotel, and they had Liberace's brother George playing violin in the lounge. That was always the thing to set you up before the gig, going down to see brother George. The original Fillmore bill was Gabe or Sabo, us in the airplane, but it was strange. Poor old Gracie Slick. Her voice went haywire after the first gig, just couldn't make it after that. I think that's why Big Brother with Janice ended up playing with us. Janice was just great. She had the hots for Jerry Stickles, our road manager. I remember her clearly jumping up and down on a hotel room bed, her dog in one arm, and a bottle of Southern Comfort in the other. We made some good friends through that gig, like the members of the airplane, especially Jack Cassidy, the bass player. I got kidnapped on a couple of occasions and taken off to hear the Grateful Dead for what seemed like eight hours at a stretch. On the Sunday afternoon before the last show, we did a free concert on a flatbed truck in Golden Gate Park. Really nice. I use Spencer Dryden of the Airplane's Drums for the gig. Thank you, Spencer. Sunday, the 25th of June, the Panhandle Golden Gate Park, San Francisco. The group performed a concert of 45 minutes, a free show on the back of a lorry, and were supported by the Ace of Cups. According to Noel Redding, on our last day in San Francisco, we played a free show from the back of a sun-drenched lorry in Golden Gate Park. Thousands of the most unusual and colourful people danced in the open air and they inspired us to play a real strenuous set. As a result, we put on a weak show that night, but got out energy up to finish with a good one. Later that night they did their last Fillmore show. The Fillmore gigs were a huge success, so much so that Bill Graham gave Chaz Chandler a $2,000 bonus and the band's wages were increased to $200 per week. Now the rage of Northern California... Their two weeks in America promised the Jimi Hendrix experience inconceivable success. Monday, the 26th of June. Jimi travels from San Francisco to Los Angeles, where he moves into Monkey, Peter Talk's mansion, Laurel Canyon, Hollywood. While in L.A., 
the Jimi Hendrix experience attend a private viewing of D.A. Pennebaker's Monterey film, which festival heads Lou Adler and John Phillips had commissioned with funds from ABC TV, who later rejected it. Later, Jimmy attends Sam and Dave concert at the Whiskey A Go Go, Los Angeles. Tuesday, 27th of June. Between the 27th and 30th of June, Jimmy was mainly preoccupied with jam sessions at Stephen Stills's house in Malibu. Stephen Stills recalled, It was a pretty eclectic bunch which included South African trumpeter Hugh Masakela, Buddy Miles, and Bruce Palmer. Brucey was around my house all the time because he was the bass player in Buffalo Springfield and Huey would show up now and then. We went through two sets of players that night, me and Jimmy, because we kept going. We played to one dawn, through the morning, and next day, all the way into the next dawn. We played for 14 hours without stopping. I had a place on the beach then, and I only had one neighbor, and she dug the noises I made, so we never had any bother from the cops. In fact, they used to come around and sit in their automobiles and listen. The local cop came along the day after Hendrix was there and said, Who was that last night? That was the finest guitarist I ever heard in my life. Then I told him who it was and said, That was the world's finest guitar player. It was when I split from Buffalo Springfield that I decided my ambition was to play bass for Jimi Hendrix, Doug Hastings of Buffalo Springfield, had this recollection. I did a jam one afternoon at the Malibu house with Jimi Hendrix, Buddy Miles, David Crosby, and Stephen Stills. I think Stephen played bass. It was the four of us playing in one part of the room, and Jimmy playing about 15 feet away from us, off in a corner with his back to us. We probably played for a couple of hours. Buddy sang and Jimmy sat, off in the corner, playing his wah-wah pedal. As a result of Monterey, Jimmy was the instant toast of the L.A. rock elite, in much the same way as he had been acclaimed in London. Peter Tork invited him up to his estate in Laurel Canyon, where other guests included Cass Elliott, Judy Collins, Joni Mitchell, David Crosby, and Mike Bloomfield. Jimmy also went to see Steve Stills' house in Malibu for a jam session involving Buddy Miles and the Buffalo Springfield bass player Bruce Palmer, among others. Steve Stills set up his amps, we took some acid and just went. We played quite literally for 20 hours straight. We must have made up 50 songs, but there was no tape running. We just played for the ocean. The music brought the cops, but this time not to cause trouble. Would it be okay if we parked across the street and listened? We don't care what you're doing, we just want to listen. And if one of our sergeants shows up, someone will sound a siren, which means just cool it for a few minutes. So me and Hendrix jammed with the sheriff's protection, and that night... I really started to learn how to play guitar. Wednesday, 28th of June. The experience did some recording from 1 to 9 p.m. at the Paramount Recording Studios, Hollywood, California, believed to be pre-recording sessions for Burning of the Midnight Lamp and the stars that play with Laughing Sam's Dice. Noel recalled, I became intrigued by the idea of playing a 12-string through a wah-wah pedal, and the idea became the intro to The Burning of the Midnight Lamp. While Chaz Chandler had this to say about the Paramount Studio, I had never recorded there myself. I booked three days because I had been told it was a state-of-the-art studio, but it was dire. The place was like a rehearsal room compared to Olympic. Los Angeles was so far behind at that time. Thursday, the 29th of June, saw The Experience interviewed at an unknown hotel in Los Angeles, followed by another session at Paramount Recording Studios, believed to be pre-recording sessions for Burning of the Midnight Lamp, and the stars that play with Laughing Sam's Dice. And finally, Friday the 30th of June saw the group spending the last day of the month at the Paramount Recording Studios for a recording and mixing session. Critically acclaimed and influential, their performance at the Monterey Pop Festival showcased the raw talent and groundbreaking sound that would make Jimi Hendrix experience one of the most celebrated bands of the era. Noel Redding summed it up best. San Francisco provided a relief from the boxed-in mood that had taken us over in England. At last we were having fun together. We laughed a lot and felt great. Everything seemed fresh and friendly and exciting, and part of the thrill was watching Jimmy enjoy his return to America as an English pop star. For his part, Jimmy grabbed me and took me off to experience his America through my stomach barbecue spare ribs were a new one on me. That concludes episode 11 in this series. Stay tuned for the next installment including July and August 1967, the first official U.S. tour and much, much more. 
Please subscribe for future content updates and many thanks for your continuing support.